Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and a very good day to all of you, my dear students. I hope that you are doing well. And now we are going to take it to the next step of understanding the structure of a report. But if, before we move ahead, uh, let's just have a quick overview of all those components that we have covered in our previous lecture. So the basics of a report, the characteristics of a report, what are the expectations uh, when we look at the structure of a report? What is expected to be there when we are looking at the structure of a report? Moving ahead, what is basically the purpose because of which a report is written? And when a report is being written, then what's that basic purpose? Significance of a report, relevance, attributes and features, and moving ahead, we concluded when I told you that it's about to come to the end, when we had this comparative analysis, a comparative study of how a report is similar to an essay and then how it is different. And we looked into those minor things which was making a difference. And we had this final look at a sample of a report as well in which there were graphs, some tables, some use of bullets headings, subheadings. So there were different components that I told you at the very start makes it a structured form of writing and that's how whenever you have to identify, examine and then organize your information you basically structure it in the form of a report. So if we talk about our today's lecture it's all going to begin from that point which I mentioned earlier I gave you a reference of the different types and nature of the audience. Well, the first look of it is that these are the three categories uh, of those readers of a report that you basically are going to prepare in the future and probably will be preparing in this semester of yours as well. So if we talk about the three general categories in which we divide the nature of the readers, we have the technical readers, we have the general readers and the managerial readers. They have their minor differences, although they all are readers, quite obvious. But if we now look into each and every one of them, starting from, of course, the technical readers, the heading itself or the name simply suggests that these are the ones who look at the technicalities within the report. And what are those technicalities? Could it be if I ask you, you'll be thinking and would certainly want to tell me and I would certainly say yes, you are very right that I am referring to the graphs, those statistics, those tables, those charts, those diagrams through which you can do all the calculation. Basically these technical readers are able to do those calculations and they are able to simply infer, deduce all the meaning out of it to reach at the basic result of your document. So they basically focus, these technical readers focus on those statistics. One thing is clear. Let's move ahead. If we talk about the second category, the managerial readers, the name is once again giving you the click and indication that this category basically is indicating all the managerial staff, the managers, the seniors, the administration, involved in different activities, having a big schedule to cover within that whole day, all their working hours. So they are going to give time to the report that you are submitting to them because you have been assigned to complete that task and then to submit to your addresses, of course in that case to be your managerial readers. But the point here is that if they are busy, how much time would they be able to give to that document? Of course it will be quite less which means that they will try to focus within that document on those things who are giving you the gist of that whole report. And last time, I am re referring to our previous lecture, we had a good discussion that when we are looking at the structure of a report, we discussed it that although the executive summary comes at the beginning, but after all is written at the end. Why? because it has to cover up all the points which are basically uh, there in a sequence within the whole report. Intro, body, method, analysis, results, inclusion, recommendation. All things together in the form of a gist are provided within that executive summary. 
So that's why it has to be crispy, it has to be compact, it has to be comprehensive, complete information should be there, but the way how it should be there will be covered up in the upcoming few minutes as well. But the point here is that's how they focus on that basic information which is short and covers up and provides the summary or the gist of that whole report. This is what the managerial readers are looking for. So now are you able to differentiate between the two? And if I take you towards the third category, the general readers, these are the ones who are going to read everything within uh, your report from start till the end because they are like not aware of those technicalities and I don't think they are that short of time compared with the managerial readers which is why they would like to know more about the manner in which you have proceeded the problem that you have identified the way you have worked uh, the data that you have analyzed and your findings your results and the way you want to come up with some interpretation leading towards the conclusion and recommendation so that's the way you can simply differentiate between these three categories although uh, simply generalized to be your readers but they have their specific differences and these should be there within your mind as well I don't think you would be able to have any kind of confusion right after this differentiation the way we just talked about it and now you have to keep that point in mind as well but let's move ahead and see some of the other information which is coming ahead now talking about the purpose we looked into it within our previous lecture as well now just focus and try to understand those minor differences which are going to make you more aware of the different types of purposes which are basically achieved by writing a report. So the most general the way it was explained to you within the previous lecture as well was that a report is basically written or the main purpose of writing a report is the information. There is something new and you basically want to inform your audience, be it the journal, the managerial or the technical readers but the point here is you want to share some information as we discussed that it discloses unknown information so it can be a case where something new has been discovered and you would like to report it and that report will be giving some information so one purpose is that it is basically for giving some information when you move ahead and if I encircle the next one it's some instructions a set of instructions when these are supposed to be provided within that uh, professional environment are basically written once again in a structured format and that format is that of course of a report so you have to basically follow that same domain same frame and that those principles those formatting especially for that professional communication and what are you basically doing providing a set of instructions which are to be followed and that is basically achieved in the form of a report as well so purpose number two if we move ahead and look towards the third one if you just look at this circle itself it seems like don't you think this thing basically comes in the mind even uh, at the outset it came in my mind as well that they all look like one and the same but there are minor differences and that is why I thought that I should first clarify my uh, concepts and then I would be able to share that same idea with you as well so that you can follow it accordingly so when we talk about the description whenever you get a question like describe something or if there is some sort of a theory some principle or some concept so you basically state its characteristics the way you have learned them or the way they were taught to you or the way you have understood any concept all its characteristics you're going to state them so if there is anything which is supposed to be stated and provided in the form of some basic points so you are basically describing them so for that purpose of description you also 
basically use that structure and format of a report so report serves the purpose of description as well are you following me now would you be able to differentiate between information instruction and description because if you are able to if you have said yes then of course we'll be moving ahead so then you would be able to differentiate between these three and the ones which are of course coming ahead like the explanation so close to the previous one but there are some differences that will be clarified once we look into it for example there is some theory which is placed in front of you and you are basically asked to explain it when you will be explaining it that means that you are not just stating that theory itself or all its characteristics rather you are going to argue over it as well which means that you will be first critically analyzing all its aspects the pros the cons the positives and the negatives but the point here is that you're going to place your opinion as well and you're going to argue about it you're going to critically analyze the situation and then you're going to place you're going to place an opinion over it as well but that opinion mind it once again the point remains the same has to be communicated in an impartial manner an impartial manner means that it should be kept away from subjectivity as much as possible when you are given the space of explaining something that means that it should be stated alongside a critical analysis so that all its positives and negatives are coming side by side whereas if you are just asked to simply state the points that means that you are basically describing something so this is basically the difference between a description when you are asked for describing something and explanation when you are asked to provide some argumentation over it as well now when these four purposes have been understood we can also move ahead to look to the fifth purpose and that is of providing a mechanism if there is a tool if there is a new appliance if there is a new machine and you don't know how to use it so of course you will look for a manual and that manual or that guidebook is basically going to serve the role of a report how because you are getting all the points with respect to the mechanism of using that tool of using that appliance that machine or whatever it is but the point here is that you're going to learn the mechanism in which you can use it so all the information with respect to the utility of that tool calling it as mechanism is provided in the form of a report as well so these are the different purposes and with respect to these purposes a report is basically structured which is why it was needed for me of course to explain all these different aspects these functions which are performed uh, by a report and i believe that you are able to follow it as well in case of any confusion a word back listen to this circle once again and then you would be able to move ahead as well of course you can move along with me as i am about to but the point here is that in case of any confusion you can just look back once again but i believe you are clear about it already so let's move ahead now talking about some of the characteristics of the technical report writing as i already told you it's basically this report is one of the form of technical writing as we are going to see some other categories as well because that is also one purpose or objective to achieve as a result you're going to have the outcome that outcome is an awareness of the different categories and which one to use at which time so you would be able to when the time comes but if we look at bullet number one what does this technical report writing does it's basically a written account of events related to a scientific inquiry so i remember i explained it to you within the previous lecture that basically it's all about the application of scientific method number one as a result you observe you analyze you identify you get the results then you 
simply conclude and provide a set of recommendations. So you are basically carrying out a scientific inquiry and once you have to put it in written then it basically becomes a report. So one of the purposes or I would call it as the characteristics of report writing because purpose was already explained to you. Don't try to mix it up. It's an exercise of effectively communicating a technical information. Now just look at it and the reason why this is in yellow. Because point remains the same. You have to basically structure it in such a way by the use of um, headings, subheadings, bullets, charts, diagrams or tables to communicate your point the way you have simply collected all the data in an effective manner that it can be understood by your target audience. Of course you can write information in a random way as well but that is not going to serve the role compared with an information which is uh, placed and formatted effectively. So that is something which you also do in case of your technical report writing because it's an exercise of effectively communicating this information. But let's move ahead. Interpretation of graph tables figures using language. This point can be easily explained by referring back to that those three overlapping circles in which we talked about the nature of the readers. And what are the three nature of the readers? Yes, you can count with me as well. The technical, managerial and the journal. Yes, very right. Point here is that the, among those three, uh, the technical readers are going to of course interpret everything by looking at the graphs, the tables, the figures themselves. But what about the general readers? Don't you think they require explanation? and description of all the points which have been placed, which have been provided in the form of these graphs and tables. So who is going to write that? Of course you as a report writer have to explain those graphs as well and where will be the space where you will be explaining all those points? Yes, you are going to have that space alongside all those charts and graphs where you have to provide an explanation of what does this graph mean or what does this diagram or that pie chart or that histogram stand for? What are those statistics for? So you have to explain those things which means you are trying to interpret what you see and what you have tried to present graphically using all the tools that which are of course written over here. So if we move ahead and look to the next point, its foundation lies in the organization of information. Even I believe now you can explain this point to me as well that we all started from that structured form of writing and how do you basically structure it by organizing the information, using the headings, prioritizing things. Organization also refers to the manner in which you sequence it of course executive summary will come at the beginning but introduction then body then methodology results conclusion recommendation and even I can talk about the bibliography or work cited and appendices because that is also an important part as you're going to see it within the upcoming slides as well so its foundation also lies in it uh, organization of the information I believe most of the points are clear and with reference to the talk that we had uh, in our initial few minutes of the previous lecture, I already gave you the cue that whenever there is something happening to you, you know what to do. So I won't be giving its indication again and again, but the point here is you can just simply have that thing whenever you want. I'll be moving ahead to explain all the points which are here written for you. Okay, now talking about the universal characteristics of a report. Why universal? Because these are the things which are generally, traditionally, conventionally expected and expected and anticipated to be there within a report when especially it is structured and written. So if we talk about point number one, active voice. And it becomes active voice by the use of active verbs as well.
you are not expected to write things in a passive way because passive language although uh, goes in line you are made to exercise to understand the difference between active voice and passive voice you know it you have been learning it we all have been learning it in our early schooling in our college days by doing all the exercises of English language paper so the point here is that among those two you have to basically use the active voice because it actually indicates you as the performer you are actually doing the task and basically the task is assigned to you so that's where it is expected that you write it and its structure and its language and its construction should be there in the form of active voice third person you have I as first person if you are simply pointing towards the person with the other person second person like you these are the the two which are to be avoided by all means which are expected to be kept minimum by all means and which one is allowed basically the third person the best thing is even not to use the third person you basically try to uh, focus on the information itself rather than he they so that thing can be kept at aside. The best thing is to focus on the information itself. However, if the condition and if the report demands you to focus and highlight on the person who is actually doing the task, then of course you try to focus on the third person. That th this is why it's written that it has to be there in the universal characteristics. No personal pronouns for objectivity. Now once again the focus is that you have to avoid I because this V or I is basically adding the element of your personal wiseness, your subjectivity and in case of a report it is anticipated to be kept objective, neutral and impartial. So that's why this thing has to be avoided as well. The next is one inch margin on all sides. Now this basically refers to the different formatting styles that we have in, uh, when it comes to writing and especially doing the academic writing, technical writing. So you have this formatting styles and referencing styles among which in case of your arts and humanities basically go for modern language association, MLA style, in case of the social sciences and the other domains you try to focus on the APA style, American Psychological Association. You're going to have the details with respect to these styles as well, the manner in which you cite it and you use these uh, author date citation system and all the others. But I'm going to give some overview and a little bit discussion, especially with reference to the exercise of report writing that you'll be doing as well. But the point is that this is one of the characteristics of the APA style that you basically keep within your document on which you are basically writing the report one inch margin on top right left and bottom so this one inch margin is there when we talk about the structuring of your report then of course the next important point is with respect to the citation proper citation this goes in line with this practice of you know uh, when one person is the writer for example if I have written something and if, if another person comes and simply claims that uh, this writing which actually was written by me belongs to him or her is committing and performing the act of plagiarism which is unethical totally considered wrong and even if I talk about the early ages the schooling ages the way we just simply you know uh, extract the ideas, take the ideas of other people, even of our fellows. So the point here is even that is also part of plagiarism. It's called idea plagiarism. And it also has many other types. For example, I had few which I had just jotted down especially to share them with you that your friend has an idea in, in for, you know, organizing the information the way he or she is going to handle the topic. If it's any topic related to, you know, population explosion or genetics, this is uh, more oriented, I guess, towards biology 
if I just take you towards computer sciences, AI, artificial intelligence, or human resource management in case of business. So there are different fields, but whenever you're given a topic and you have to write over it, so first, of course, you make an outline, you make a plan of handling that topic itself, the way you're going to place your information first, what should come ahead, then how you're going to divide it, how are you going to explain it. So the point is that the way you have made an outline, and if there's someone who is not sure, of course, he has one thing in common with you, and that is that you both are working on almost the same topic. And one person has already done the exercise of the whole planning, the way he or she is going to prepare an outline and the way he or she is going to cover it. And you just simply take the whole idea and use all those headings in that order. So this, my dear friends, my dear fellow students, is also falling under the category of plagiarism as well. Borrowing that organization. So that's how it becomes unethical as well. So you have to avoid it. If you can generally take the idea from someone, if they are willing to share it with you, so it's okay. But it's becoming more detailed. Point here is that collusion uh, is also another example of plagiarism. And this basically refers to that it's a group work which has been performed, which has been completed by four or five people. And out of those four or five, just all of a sudden, one individual simply changes everything, does some minor changes, and afterwards, write his name at the top, removes all the name of all the other four or five people who were helping him or her, and claims to be the absolute writer, the sole writer of that whole report or that document. Well, that's basically collusion as well, and it also falls within that same category. Then moving ahead, you have written one thing and now you are submitting it in multiple places. For example, you in future, inshallah, will be working on research papers, you'll be carrying out your individual research. And in that case, if you have submitted it at one place and all of a sudden, before any signal of whether it has been approved or it has been rejected or it it has been like it was returned back for some minor revision afterwards it will be accepted but in that case you in the meanwhile are sending is it to some other place some other journal for publication this is also considered to be unethical and has to be avoided as well and in addition to that actual person or actual writer are like two or three of some research work and you are documenting some other people as well within the authors, list of authors who have worked on it, that also it becomes part of plagiarism as well. So, and to put it in that context of the school environment, the college environment, the university environment, when you are taking the ideas of other people, when you are simply copy pasting the assignments of other people, the other students, the fellows, just thinking that uh, our teacher would never bother to, you know, just tally and compare whether these are similar or not. Well, nowadays it's the age of technology. The softwares can clearly identify all those places where you have the similarities, where you have the differences. So they can clearly pinpoint all those places which are being copy pasted. Number two, uh, the manner in which the information is directly being copied from some book, from some internet source, if it's being placed and you know pasted in your document and then you are claiming it to be your own well that's purely unethical and it falls within plagiarism and higher education commission just for the information has this zero tolerance policy for it and due to which many dissertations are rejected once they are proven to be plagiarized and therefore this is basically the upper level in your case if you uh, start from scratch from your very first step to start writing on your own whenever you have to you know uh, Take information from some source you properly cite it Which is why it is written over here and there are ways of citation You can when you are you know giving reference to some work so you can use uh, footnotes those footnotes are basically a reference of the work uh, which has been taken and you basically provide the reference at the bottom of the page at the foot of the page which is why it's known as the footnote 
And in case you are providing at the end of the work, then it becomes the end note. And last but not the least, the third mode is the parenthetical citation. Parenthesis is basically the word from which you can derive this parenthetical citation, the citation style in which you basically acknowledge the actual author or the actual source of that information that you are taking from the source. So you acknowledge by citing him or her within your own work and the mode when you basically you know, write after the information when you are directly quoting it so you put it within quotation marks within those uh, double commas as there's a quote to reported speech so the manner in which you simply take the information right afterwards you write the surname or the last name of that author then place a comma and right afterwards that book which you basically have used to cite that author you look at the date of publication the date on which that work was actually cited for example if it was 2010 and uh, uh, Naeem was the name of the surname of that person who actually was the author so parenthesis Naeem comma 2010 comma uh, bracket close so in this way this is basically the parenthetical citation before that the actual reported speech within quotation marks double commas so this is the way you basically can avoid plagiarism because you are actually acknowledging the source so there is nothing wrong with it if you actually want to quote or place the sayings, the talk, the ideas of another person, but it has to be done in uh, an ethical way, in an acceptable way, then there will be nothing wrong with it. So that's why it's written that it should be properly cited. That's how you will also write a good and a proper report when every author has been properly cited. And right afterwards, Referencing the credible authors, the authors who have their credibility, authenticity, who are, who are being cited, who are being read, who, whose work is considered to be genuine, you know, the kind of citation also tells you. And there are many other criteria as well to determine who is actually the credible author. But reading basically tells you whether they are the uh, authentic and the credible author or not, or just a business. So point here is that this reference of referencing also indicates the um, indication of that referencing style that we have already talked about a little bit detailed discussion on this slide but there is so much which has been written over here and it will help you of course so you can focus on this point once again at the end of a report or a document there is a page of work cited and for that and to prepare it, you basically need Microsoft Word and some other software such as Sitefast, Zotero, Bibme, and others. And their reference is also coming in the upcoming lectures as well. But right now, I'm just saying that once you open up even Microsoft Word and you want to, you know, add a reference and citation. So in that case, it asks you who is the author. What's the name of the book? You type it. What's the year of publication? And some further information. And once you add it, it's going to once again make that parenthetical citation for you. You can place it uh, at the place where you are, you know, placing that reported speech. And alongside you, of course, simply click on the add reference page. And within that reference page, a complete reference. Uh, just the way you're going to see it within the slides as well. So in this way, you are able to make a complete reference page or a works cited page for yourself very easily without any trouble at all. The knowledge shall be given to you so that you may have the awareness, but that's how easy it is once you give it a try. So I guess it's time to move ahead and for you to do your thing as well. This is basically the report structures beginning this is the beginning that's how it all begins and this is the very first page which is why it's known as the title page where you basically place the title as well it's basically written in upper and lower case at the very center you have seen you know the way um, the title is written in the book as well you can see sample reports as well so in the center in uppercase and lowercase 
capitalize and small words so it's a combination of these two the way you basically write anything so the first letter of every word as if it's you know starting the sentence is capitalized and all the other rules of English language that you know so title comes at the center alongside you have the submission date the date in which on which this uh, report is being submitted alongside who is the actual author from whom it is being submitted whether it's one person or two person or a group so it could be any you just have to mention the name and to whom it is being written so everything counts and should be there in the title page some additional information with respect to this title page is that in case of your Microsoft Word document if you are using it so at the top you have multiple options over there at the top you have this option of insert and from that insert at the right if you go on the right hand side you have the option of header from that header that suppose this is that you know page so this is the place where you basically place that header this is the area where the main heading would come the title this is the header and this is the place where you basically add the page number the pagination but while talking about this header on the very first page on the title page you write running head R U W N I N G then H E A D right afterwards it's uh, a punctuation mark two dots colon and afterwards the same title which you have written at the center will be written in capitalized form this is according to the rules which I am sharing so that's why I want you to note them down even now especially good for one who are already you know taking all the notes so it's quite useful for you but the point here is that's how you write it at the very beginning you write running head as well and the page numbering come on the right hand side once you move ahead right after the title page what's coming ahead so if you uh, go to that one basically let me just take a try and take you towards the next page you basically right after you know when you have prepared all their title page this is basically reference to the formatting the way you prepare your final draft but once you're opening the report so you see all these things so afterwards comes the abstract or you can call it as the, uh, the executive summary so when it comes to the page of the executive summary I'm not talking about how you write the executive summary I'm just talking about the formatting especially that running hat at the top left so that small font size running head alongside colon and your main topic so in that case on the very next page you're not going to write the word R U W N I N G H E A D running head won't be written you are only going to write as a header your topic that's all your main title that will stay there at the top left side as I already told you the way you can do it is using Microsoft Word insert header write it you'll be able to do it and page is also inserted in the same way insert page it will ask you on which side um, top right mm, bottom right top left bottom left so you can decide it and you can give all the commands it will follow it but the point here is in all the other pages except title page you're going to mention that title at the top left but not running head running head is only written at the title page with that conversation complete uh, now let's talk about what basically an abstract is your next page basically abstract as I told you is that short summary of the whole report some of the qualities include its qualitative nature that it shouldn't have those numerical figures those statistics that is not the time to mention all this it has to be written in a qualitative nature that is how it is going to be uh, structured as an abstract moving ahead it should clearly state the purpose and outcome with results this is also another important quality when it comes to writing an abstract and another thing to avoid is no abbreviation I believe I can highlight these as well and I can use the arrow as well to talk about them one by one so qualitative nature means no use of numerical data and statistics 
just mention the concepts as they have been explained within the report by you. So just write them down, uh, explaining all the concepts. Moving ahead, no use of abbreviation. Now this is the reason why it's written and read by your managerial readers as well because they want things in short but that doesn't mean that you start using the abbreviation that they are not aware of if you are making new abbreviation especially those ones who are not that much common uh, in the common talk of the audience they're going to have a lot of problem to understand especially your managerial readers I'm not referring to the general ones because they're going to go through the content but the administration will have a lot of trouble if you are using the abbreviation so you have to avoid it when you are structuring and writing your abstract and if I take the arrow down purpose and outcome now you know what the purpose is there were so many purposes for which a report is written think of that circle and then you will be able to answer it so what is the basic purpose out of all these and if it is uh, other than that and alongside what would be the outcome and what was basically the outcome I would say that because you know the reason it comes basically at the end and alongside with all the expected and anticipated and all the calculated results so everything is written without any abbreviation in a qualitative style which makes it an abstract in case of you know the formatting I would like to once again add few further information that you can just jot down the average uh, words word limit I would say is around 150 to 250 words within which you are allowed to you know simply jot down the gist of the whole report so you have to keep it short and the allowed word limit as per the format as per the conventions is around 200 to 250 words that is all try not to exceed that limit moving ahead in addition to that summary if there are some key words which become the focus of your whole report and you basically state them at the bottom of your you know that executive summary so they are basically generally uh, italicized yes they are italicized and indented as well so basically the whole abstract is uh, kept at the left hand side you have the options in the Microsoft Word of aligning the text on the left hand side center position or the right hand side you can click on all the options which are available at the top so in case of your abstract you keep it left and justified this is the option which is also available uh, I guess that's the way you will see the option this is left and this is uh, center and this is right and there will be a fourth option at the very right in which all these are equal which means the lines are balanced this is basically justified so in case of your abstract you also justify the whole text now we move ahead to talk about the table of contents now these table of contents are also very much important because this once again brings me to that discussion of you know uh, one person making the whole outline the way he's going to organize the information and another person comes out of nowhere and takes the whole idea of organizing the information because that's also a tough task of organizing the information as you're going to see in the upcoming lectures when we'll be talking about the writing process itself so among uh, that writing process within that writing process and especially with reference to the pre-writing stage the very first stage you have so many techniques of first of all doing the pre-writing making an outline clustering things connecting things together so that you may be able to find the exact link between all those concepts which are like randomly there within your mind so you give them a sequence and all of a sudden that sequence is being stolen so what that is yes plagiarism and that's why it has to be avoided by all means so that sequence and it's basically uh, organized after such a long effort is also placed within your report as the table of contents also known as the TOCs now if you talk in general about the structure 
you are going to have uh, the introduction first, then the literature review, then the methodology, analysis, results, conclusion, yeah, and recommendation. So that's how you move in that sequence and that sequence is also going to have certain headings. These are the main headings. Among these main headings are going to be certain subheadings and those subheadings are going to have are basically placed are basically given a degree of heading. There are degrees of headings that you can also see uh, within a Microsoft Word document as well. For example, and if I am talking about the first one which is the introduction, you give it one. Within that uh, introduction if you are just first of all stating the aim of your report, what was the aims and objective and if you simply say, okay, let me put it in the right order. If you first of all state the problem right after the main heading of introduction and if you give it 1.1, so this becomes the second degree of heading. For example, 1 is the first degree of heading within which you are writing uh, the second degree of heading. Under the second degree of heading, you simply state statement of the problem. After the statement of the problem comes your objectives, if you have to state them, which are not part of the second chapter, mind it. The second chapter is literature review. This is 2 and this is 1. So if I am still there in your first chapter, so this will be given the second degree of heading and it will be 1.2. However, if there is anything which is needed to be explained within that second degree of heading, for example, within that problem, if you require something to be explained even further, so it will be taken to the third degree of heading and it will have, uh, if I am not wrong and if we are getting short of space, 1.1.1. So under 1 is the second degree which is 1.1 and under 1.1 you have the third degree which is 1.1.1 which is an explanation of the statement of the problem. So that's how you basically give degrees of heading to your outline and that's how it is basically structured. By talking about uh, the way you have sections, you have subsection and you also give reference to your appendices as well. Appendix Appendices is basically all the additional information which is not uh, the, you know, which also is, although I would say is relevant because the whole study has been carried out as a result of that appendix. But if it's not there within the report, the report itself would still remain comprehensible, understandable because that's going to just increase the number of pages. And as I told you, Short, due to the shortage of time, your reader wants to get the gist as early as possible. So, if there is a need of looking into the additional information, be it a questionnaire or some detailed interview which was carried out, so that is basically placed at the end of the report under the heading of appendix and it is kept aside. And if anyone is interested to give it a reading, they can do it. But that remains at the size. But its reference is once again there within the TOCs. So I believe that thing is also clear. You are aware of the degrees of heading as well. I want you to write after the lecture or even now just you can just you know that pause thing and open up Microsoft Word. Look at the right top right you will have the degrees of heading and if you just explore it and then give the command of making an outline it will do it for you. Making it more easier you can watch always a tutorial of how to you know make an outline in a Microsoft Word document and give you all the instructions that you need and you'll become a master. But that is how you basically prepare a table of content as well. Now talking about yeah this is this is the one that I was referring to just for the example. When it comes to the very first part and if we give it you know a number one so this is basically the introduction and within the introduction you start from the description of the problem. You basically state the problem at the very beginning that what basically is the problem as we talked about it. Identification of the problem and then the analysis. 
right after its description. I don't think description will be an issue for you either because you know it also was one of the purposes of writing a report. So if we move ahead, you're going to state your objectives. Why are you carrying out a study and what is basically the focus? As in our case, as we are going through this mode of hybrid learning, we also have the objectives. Those objectives are to teach you all the skills to make you an efficient and a perfect report writer. Number one, number two, to give you the comparison uh, of this report so that you can differentiate it with all the other forms of technical documents as well. And moving ahead, giving you the skills of carrying out research so that you can just, you know, uh, analyze, critically analyze things and to present them on your own, giving you sufficient presentation skills as well. So we have certain objectives as well. And how to do it, you basically then move towards the next step, which is the method. What was the basic method which uh, will be used for carrying out this task to achieve those objectives? Well, in our case, we are delivering and recording and uh, having this information explorer. And I would say the exchange of information we recording the lecture and giving it to you so that you may be able to follow and understand all the points. So this is one of the methodology and you have to state it in this way as well. Then in case of the most interesting and anticipated results, so you state them as well when we talk about the introduction and the most important things should be are supposed to be kept uh, in brief. Brevity is expected whenever you are writing the introduction, otherwise the focus will be lost, especially of your reader. So things are expected to be there, all these which the way they have been provided to you, but it is expected alongside that you provide all the information with brevity. You move ahead and talk about the design and the procedure. You explain all those points. You will be wondering where did the literature review go? Literature review, my dear students, is basically written according to this format, the way it's being provided to you, it's your new start within that introduction. When you are explaining all the points, when you have to state the problem, first you set a background. That background will take part of that literature, that body, then you will be stating the problem, then you will be explaining all the things. Alongside you will be providing and you are expected to provide that detailed body as well and afterwards you move ahead towards the stage of design and procedure. So you explain that design of yours theoretically, explaining all the principles, um, what's your population and what's your sampling technique of getting the sample out of it, what's your research method whether it's you know qualitative or quantitative what techniques will be used for collecting data, be it an interview or a survey, observation, there are many. So you explain them. Then you of course move toward the testing of the proposed design. So whether it has been tested to how much extent it has been successful, so you give its reference as well, but not much of those specific measurements, the way technical language is basically used. So you do not go into that much detail that is basically like incomprehensible for the reader you ba basically provide the information which is needed and you try to explain it in the simplest possible words as you can and you basically keep it brief and getting to the point so theoretical description the way uh, your method is what's the basic population uh, what's the sampling technique what's the research method itself what are the tools uh, if there is any testing which has been done, giving its reference as well, where this method has already been used and what were their findings, how do they find it, how significant do they find it, who have already used such methodology and at what place. No specific measurements uh, when you are giving reference of those findings or uh, those applications which have been done before you and you basically try to keep it brief and to the point because this brevity is going to make you succeed because you are providing everything and in a short way. Textual explanation. This is basically when you move towards the next step and that is of results in discussion. So when you come to the stage when you have already explained the methodology and now moving towards the next step of explaining uh, all your findings, 
you state your results and you then provide a set of discussion. That discussion, my dear students, should come alongside figures, tables and diagrams. This matters a lot because as I told you, that you want to make your report as presentable as possible. So you will always have the space just the way you looked at the very first sample that we looked into our lecture number one. So you remember the way graphs were there, the tables were there, the charts were there. These are the things which should be there and that is going to have a positive impression, especially for whom? Who look at those graphs? We talked about it at the very beginning. Yes, that technical readers really need information in a very short space and they are able to you know just look into it and understand all the points so for that you need to place them and for whom will you be explaining it textually yes the general readers require an explanation of all those points as well and which is why these should be expected like these should be accompanied alongside all those graphs as well so that's how these Figures, tables and diagrams become important and these should be there as well within your results and discussion. The way you have found them, the way you explain all those points. And then at the end, we are moving towards the final stage. You basically conclude your finding on the basis of all your results, the way you have interpreted them, the way you have discussed all those results, you come at a conclusion. And what does this conclusion stand for or how should it be written? It's basically uh, a quantitative, quantitatively summing up all the results once again with brevity. This brevity doesn't leave you because that brevity is always important. You have to keep information there, of course, but by the limited use of word. And this will come with some learning, with some technique, with some exercise, with some practice. And we're going to do it as well in the upcoming lectures as well. But the point here is, now is the time when you quantitatively sum up all the results. Over there in the previous section, they are in detail. But now this is conclusion. So the one who was reading your executive summary may want to, might be interested to, see the results in short and your findings so first they will look at your conclusion and that's why it has to be written very crisply it should be brief and it should state all the points without any abbreviation once again how about um, oh my apologies we are already moving towards the sample but the point here is that I thought that there's going to be a tick but if I just simply point it out for you that there shouldn't be any abbreviation because the one who was reading that executive summary without an abbreviation is will be the one who might read your conclusion so in that case for him or her to understand you should avoid abbreviation and try to focus on the words themselves then within that conclusion you should give reference to the problem that you have focused alongside what were your objectives what was the procedure, meaning methodology, and what were the most interesting results. So all their references should be there, and that's how your, uh, your report will come towards the end. But that's not the end, because first look at the reference list. And this reference list, once again, is referring to the fact that you have to clearly provide and document all the sources that you have cited, that you have read, that's the way, uh, you know, the reference list comes at the end of that format. We're going to have like a details uh, discussion on each section as well in which you're going to see how each section is supposed to be written. This is like an overview, an overview of the whole report structure, which is why it was discussed like uh, in a bit detail. But we are going to have discussion on each section as well within our upcoming few lectures as well won't take long but the purpose of it is that have, after all it is report writing so our first and foremost like focus is to make you an efficient report writer and afterwards you will be made to compare other technical documents as well so this is one of the referencing style you can just simply see that there is a reference of web link as well then the manner in which it has been accessed the date of the access in a similar way some other references as well but point here is that 
this is a general reference you basically have to follow the referencing style which will be explained to you and I, have, I will be talking about it just the way as I discussed few points with you at the very initial few minutes of the lecture but that's the way you are expected and you are supposed to document and cite everything rather than just pasting things and claiming it to be your own effort of writing it won't be accepted because software is always there to identify all the places from where you have taken things and at the end you'll be facing the consequences if you have performed the plagiarism which I am sure you will not because now you are aware of it and you will always avoid it in your future life and your professional life as well because in case of your professional life if I talk about the academic first which is there so that may harm your grades but in case of your future life you may have serious consequences when it comes to your job as well so that's why these things are important and these should be not just learned for self rather you can just teach it to the others as well to avoid copy pasting by all means and try to you know believe in yourself and your own writing skills and it will be taught to you you will be you'll become a very good writer right after these lectures I'm sure about it okay this is once again like a review of that point that I already explained to you so even uh, now you are able to explain it to me in case of the technical readers focus on figures managerial readers they focus on the executive summary and in case of your general readers they want some good simple and comprehensible language and in detail the whole document this is what matters so that's how we have covered all these three and now we can move ahead to look and talk about the language because the last point was all about you know the language on which the focus is there of all the three categories of readers especially the managerial and the general one because the technical kind of goes for the graphical figures so you have to bring clarity and clarity basically begin, uh, comes from the use of active voice and active verbs just as I told you alongside a complete focus on brevity keeping things simple and declarative there are different types of sentences as well I don't think there is a need of going into that much detail but the declarative within which you are simply declaring things is the sentence construction which is expected to be there within a report and keeping things impartial neutral is the point that you are getting from objectivity so no use of I or V meaning Clarity, brevity and objectivity is going to be expected and to be there within your report structure. That's how it will become more good. Now this is the final part, the last part of the whole lecture and you can you know relax because this is the final part and afterwards you are uh, good to go, all set to be free. With this slide I would like to mention here that this is not like a type of a report this is a mode of report writing and that's why it becomes important and should be understood accordingly in case of your deductive and word inductive so all of a sudden it comes in mind that it refers to the reasoning the deductive reasoning and the inductive reasoning so quite related to it because in case of your deductive reasoning you begin from the journal to specific and in case of your inductive uh, reasoning it's from specific to journal well same case applies over here when you look at deductive report which is or I would say the deductive mode of report writing this mode of report writing is generally used for routine messages used for sharing neutral information and quite open and clear presentation of information this is what is achieved in case of a deductive mode of report writing so when you have to share some general routine message or neutral information now you can remember the point as well when you'll be writing some short reports and you have to share certain small information at a smaller scale you can do this deductive mode whereas in case of your deductive mode discussion comes before conclusion very much important why because in case of your inductive report you start from a specific thing and then move towards general which means when you are raising something specific which is new you need detail to defend your point because 
use of factual information to draw conclusion this is basically the mode and your audience is quite informed when it comes to the general phenomenon and all of a sudden if there is something new coming something specific is coming so you can get a good bombardment towards yourself and you need to defend yourself so with some expected resistance you have to keep in mind some expected resistance and alongside you have to structure your report so the information will be moving from specific towards journal and when you are taking things towards specific side so you require factual information and detail to defend yourself that's how your readers will be able to follow talking about the last sequence in case of your deductive report now you know the structure title executive summary then the introduction I'm talking about general to specific so general introduction and after some good discussion you uh, after providing some general information you are concluding things you move towards discussion because now things are becoming more specific and then you provide the reference meaning general to specific whereas in case of your inductive report title page introduction and you are within the introduction specific information which means now you have to defend yourself facts and figures detailed discussion or on the basis of which specific to general conclusion and recommendation so that's how things become a little different and this is the thing the last thing or the last slide that I even want you to just get a screenshot or even you'll always have the slide we just come to the end I would like to thank you for your patience as well because there were things which were quite tricky but you have followed them each and every one of them and with that I would like to tell you that we are done with our today's session we are going to look into the manner in which each and every section is written in our upcoming lectures till that time have a good break take some rest right now even when you are done instead of me you can have a glass of water as well for you know watching and for your patience of course i enjoyed it explaining all the points to you hope you have followed it as well well i'll see you in the next lecture till that time take good care assalamu alaikum and thank you